Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this gorgeous May evening as we get ready to talk about tips, tricks, and tools. Bird ID made easy. This is a great time of year to be thinking about birds. Um, I'm awash with new bird song all the time, it feels like, and I'm getting very excited for spending more time outdoors. And I wanted to share with you in this webinar some ways that we can kind of demystify bird ID and take advantage of some of the great tools that exist out there for us. So I'm coming to you from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, where our mission is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. My name is Kelly Schaefer, and I'm our outreach coordinator, and I'm joined today by Susan Licker, our learning coordinator. In our, the chat window, she'll be answering questions and sharing links with you. Feel free to flag her or I down if you have questions as we go along. And here on the K-12 education team, we create innovative resources and deliver transformative trainings that empower educators to build young people's science skills through birds, nature, participatory science, and inquiry. One quick note as we get ready to um, go through tonight's webinar. If you haven't used Zoom before, it's a great idea to make sure that in the chat window you are sending to everyone. We'll have a couple opportunities to share our thoughts throughout this webinar, and I want to make sure that we can all see what each other says. So if you open up the chat window, which looks like a speech bubble icon, and then where it says to, if it says hosts and panelists, you want to click on that and make sure you switch it to everyone. And if you'd like to dock your chat panel to the side of your window, you can exit full screen to do that. Okay, so in today's webinar, our goal, my goal for us is to talk about bird ID, talk about the four clues to bird ID, review some free online apps and resources that can help make bird ID easier, talk a little bit about sound and how that plays a role in identifying birds, and then discuss some different ways that we can approach viewing birds with our students. Let's jump right in with the four clues to bird ID. So there are four clues, size and shape, color pattern, habitat, and behavior. And size and shape is actually the first clue to bird ID, which can be a little counterintuitive. I think when you first start looking at birds, your eyes are drawn so much to the colors that they can almost be a little distracting. And as we go through these four clues, I hope you'll see that size and shape can actually be one of the more fundamental parts of bird identification. So when we're talking about the size and shape of a bird, we're talking about not just the size and shape of the body, but the size and shape of different parts of the body. So the wings, the tails, the beak is a really important one. So my goal for this webinar is that you'll come away thinking a little bit more about what parts of the bird to look at. Because sometimes when you first start identifying birds, that's one of the hardest things is just knowing where to focus your intention. Birds are by nature flighty, so they can be difficult to see for a long time. And so knowing where to put your focus can really help. The next ID clue is color pattern. So we're looking for what colors are where on the bird. So what markings do you see on what parts of the body? For habitat, this is basically telling us where the bird lives and that can help us narrow down the birds we're looking for and then behavior. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we're talking about things like posture and foraging and flight patterns. That might all sound kind of big if you haven't gone far into bird ID yourself, but um, they are really things that you kind of pick up the more that you're out there. And before I go too much further, I do want to throw this question out to you. How many of you, or let's phrase it this way, 
what how far along on your bird id journey are you do you consider yourself a beginner are you intermediate are you advanced and if you are kind of further along in your journey are these four clues driving with you are these things that make sense for how you look at birds see some folks saying they're beginners they're not really Birders, lifelong beginner. I love that. I kind of identify with that myself, especially working at a place like the lab where there are some folks who are just insanely good. I see some intermediate folks. Okay, great. The four, the four clues this help. I was thinking about these clues a lot recently. I don't know if you're familiar with an event called Global Big Day. It happens in May, typically the second weekend, I want to say. It's on International Migratory Bird Day. And you you go out and see as many birds as you can in a day, if you're doing like a big day. Or if you're just a regular, you know, beginner birder, you can just report a few birds and go to this global effort to see as many birds as we can across the world in one day. And so I've really been thinking while I was out on Saturday, I did like 14 hours of birding. I was thinking about how I think about birds and how I look at birds and how that um, affects how I talk about birds and teach about birds. I do see a note come in that I'm having some trouble with volume. So if you give me one moment here, I'm gonna try plugging in a headset. Just give me one sec. that sound any better? No, that's actually worse, Kelly, or just as bad. Okay, let me see if I can fix that. How about that? Is that any better? No, it's still the coming in and out. So like you're starting out really low and then, then it picks up. All right, it looks like the headset is not helping any, so I'm just going to sit a little closer to the microphone and hope that works. Thanks for letting me know. Um, please flag me down if it continues to get worse. Okay, so I see that we have a lot of folks with different levels of birding here, but a lot of beginners and I think that's a really great way to teach birding. Um, one of the things I was noticing when I've been thinking about how I think about birds is sometimes when I teach birds, I assume folks know things that I know just because I've been doing it for a while. So being a co-learner with somebody is such a powerful way to teach bird ID. So I'm excited that you're all here and thinking about helping kids learn to identify birds too. All right, so let's talk about size and shape. As I said, this can be kind of a counterintuitive first clue to bird ID, but it's a really powerful one. So figuring out the shape of a bird can help you identify that bird to a particular group. And once you put it into a group, it's a lot easier to identify. So what I mean by that is if we look at this image here and we watch this heron turn into a silhouette, we can really see the shape of the bird stand out, that long neck, those long legs, that long beak. And if we saw a bird of that shape and we said heron, and we went to our part of our field guide or our bird ID app that is herons, we're gonna have to look through a lot fewer birds than if we were looking at the whole book. So size and shape can really help us narrow things down. And one of the really useful ways to think about size and shape is think about it in terms of silhouettes. 
Uh, but before we do that, I want to just share a little resource with you. So we're not going to watch this video just because it's 10 minutes long, but these are fantastic videos. This is um, an inside birding video. It's a whole series of videos that goes over the four clues to bird identification. And it does a really good job of explaining how to look at birds in these different ways. Um, and this, these slides that I'm sharing with you tonight, a lot of them are adapted from a free resource we have, our Science and Nature Activities for Cooped Up Kids, which have slide decks for different age groups. Um, and this one, this one and some of the slides that I'll be showing in a moment come from Activity 5, which is the Bird ID activity. And Susan can share a link to those in the chat window for you. So these next slides I'm going to be showing you are adapted from that. So when we're talking about size and shape and we are looking at the silhouettes of birds, we can start to think about how that can help us get to those bird groups. So I wanna just have us take a look at these silhouettes here and try and put a couple of these into bird groups. Let's start with number two. If you had to put that into a group of birds, what would you say? Yeah, number two here, waterfowl, duck, water bird. Yeah, so you can see it's got that kind of medium length legs. It's got webbed feet, that really horizontal body and the medium length neck. So that's a great, those are all great clues for a duck. What if we went to number four, this one here? Yeah, songbird, that's a great, yeah. That would actually absolutely be the group for this bird. Um, this one to me screams Robin. <laughs> yeah, I saw somebody says Robin in there too. Yeah, uh, it's got that really kind of barrel chest going for it. And then as you're looking at these, and one of the things that I think is so cool about these is you might be able to pull more information out than you realize. And if you start looking at these with students, they'll be surprised what they already know about birds and how they're already able to sort them into groups in their minds. So here's the breakdown. You all were right, duck and songbird, but then we also have the classic owl, woodpecker, goose, hummingbird, and that soaring hawk or raptor. All right, so how does that actually help us play into more specific bird ID? This is a fun little uh, activity from the slides I mentioned, the Science and Nature activities for Cooped Up Kids. Just play along with me here. Can you match the blue jay to the silhouette? So you can do upper left, upper right, lower right, or lower left. Okay, I see some answers rolling in. And I want you to share too why you chose that silhouette. What is something that stands out to you that makes you feel confident? Okay, Elizabeth is pointing out the beak shape. That's an awesome, awesome clue. I saw somebody else say the size of the crest. The weight of the body and the crest. Great. These are all awesome, awesome clues and ways to look at a bird. So yes, absolutely. It's the upper right hand one. And you all called out some of the things that I think are really important clues. So we have a nice slender bill here on the blue jay. When you look over here on the left, this looks like a cardinal to me. You see a nice triangular seed-eating beak with a slicked back crest. 
here on the lower right hand side, we have a slender beak, but we have a very slim crest and a very slim and upright posture. This would be a cedar waxwing. And then down here on the lower left, it's a smaller size overall, um, smaller beak and just a less heavy body. And this would be a tufted titmouse. So just starting to look at these silhouettes, we're start to ab being able to pick out some of the parts of a bird's body that are important to pay attention to. So beak is crucial. Um, that overall size and shape and heft of the body that you were pointing out, that's really important too. And those are things that come with time, right? So you're not gonna be able to look at every bird you first see and, and identify it based on size and shape. Once you start getting some common ones, things get a lot easier. I was discussing this with a friend the other day, and when you first start birding, it can sometimes be hard to make positive IDs just because you don't know what else is out there. And so you feel like, oh, maybe there's something else out there that looks like this bird and I don't know about it, so it's hard to make a positive ID. And we'll talk about some tools that exist to help you identify birds with confidence in a little while. But I just want you to know that's a totally normal feeling if you felt that way. And cluing into some of these size and shape clues and knowing where to look at a bird can really help with that. Another note I wanted to share about judging size is that judging size in the field is hard. It's tricky. Um, and it's not really useful to think, oh, that bird's like seven inches tall, because that's really hard to judge from a distance. So one of the ways we at the lab really like to think about it, and if you've used the Merlin Bird ID app, this will be a familiar way to think about it to you, is judging a bird in comparison to other birds that you know well. So is it smaller than a robin, but larger than a sparrow? Is it crow-sized? Is it goose-sized? Is it somewhere in between? And this is a really powerful way to help your students view it too. Um, we have some science unit kits that have life-size birds in it just to help you get used to viewing life-size bird images and not the actual birds. Um, to help you get used to judging size in this way. So this is a really useful way to think about size when you are identifying birds. So the next important bird ID clue is color pattern. So now we're getting into that eye-catching part of birds, all these beautiful colors they have. And so when we're talking about color pattern, we're, we mean paying attention to what colors appear where on the body. And so you can see here, I have picked out on this image some field marks of a house sparrow. So field marks are gonna be things that you can see out in the field. I, I hope you could hear my air quotes there, the field being when you're out observing things um, that will stand out and help you identify these birds. So some field marks that we see on this bird are the black chin and bib, it's got a brownish overall body, and it's got this great white wing bar right here. So these are gonna be good field marks to help you identify birds. If you've tried identifying sparrows, you might've heard them referred to as little brown jobbies or little brown birds. Um, and they can be challenging because they can look very similar. So it's important to see if you notice some of these in cool field marks that really stand out. So thinking about what color is where on the body. And so to help students think about color pattern, I like to think about imagining you have a friend come up to you and say, I saw a black and red bird. Well, both of these birds fit that description, don't they? So it helps to pay attention to where the colors are on the body. So if I said I saw a red bird with black wings, you'd be able to say, oh, that sounds like a scarlet tanager or a black bird with red wings or red shoulders would be a red winged blackbird. And just some notes about 
where colors can be really important. There's overall is super important, but if you ever see color on the face, around the eyes, um, stripes on the wings or a crown, those are typically going to be really important clues for you. So the face and the wings can be really, really important for some tricky bird IDs. So it's good to think about those while you're, when you catch a glimpse of a bird flitting by. So let's pause here for a second and take a look at some field marks. So what field marks do you notice on one of these birds? You can pick one and share a field mark that you see. So remember a field mark is something that is gonna stick out to you as an identifiable feature when you're outside looking at birds. Kate's saying the rusty chest on the robin. Susan's pointing out the red patch on the downy woodpecker's head. Yellow beak on a robin, absolutely. Spotted wings, yes, Elizabeth, absolutely. Those, those spotted wings can uh, signal woodpecker a lot. So that can even help you get to group. Fun fact about the red patch on the head of this downy woodpecker, that indicates to us it's a male. The female looks the same, however, it lacks that red patch. Somebody's pointing out the white eye ring. So yeah, the robin has a partial white eye ring or a broken white eye ring. So that is a, a ring of color around the eye that you can sometimes see on birds. It's super prominent on some birds. Some birds have broken ones. Some birds don't have them. And a black back on the robin. Absolutely. So those are all great field marks. Let's talk a little bit about behavior. So when we're talking about behavior, we're talking about a lot of different aspects of how birds move and, and live. Um, so you might notice Foraging behavior is really important in some birds, like shorebirds, and I'm still learning that myself. Um, but if you think about something like a heron stalking along a pond, that's a pretty distinctive behavior that can lead to help you identifying something. But so is posture. So sometimes you'll have birds that sit very, very upright and others that almost like sit horizontally. Um, if you think of like a morning dove, sometimes they can be very horizontal. Well, sometimes they can be very vertical. That's a bad example. Um, a pigeon is a better one. There are much, their bodies tend to be oriented much more horizontally, whereas um, something like a robin tends to stand up very vertically, very straight. So posture can be a good clue. Um, again, these are things that are gonna come to you with time, but if you notice that about a bird when you're looking at it, it's great to take note of it. Um, unique patterns of movement. So by that, I, I mean larger patterns of movement. So like the robins, run, 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 stop, run, 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 stop when they're foraging on the ground. Um, or the example that I have on the slide here is birds like white-breasted and red-breasted nuthatches. They tend to move around trunks facing downwards. So they kind of climb down the trunks. Whereas a similar bird lives in a similar habitat, climbs on trunks, but faces upwards would be a brown creeper and they climb up the tree. And so that can be little clues like that that can help you. So other things that can be useful are flight patterns. Um, a couple things came to mind when I was thinking about flight patterns. Birds like woodpeckers tend to flap, 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 and then tuck their wings. And so they kind of drop, it's called a drop flight. So they're, they'll go straight and then they drop down and they lift back up and then they drop down. So it's like making a, a sine wave. Um, 
or like a goldfinch does that as well. And goldfinches are a great one where you can combine sound and flight to help you identify them in the air. They have a little flight call that sounds like they're saying potato chip, and then they do that drop flight. So they do the chip and dip where they drop down as they're flying. And then you're also looking for things like repeated movements. So movements that a bird repeats often, little movements around their body is more of what I'm thinking about, like a bobbing head or a bobbing tail. And those can be really helpful when you're trying to look at two similar birds. So this little video here is of a spotted sandpiper and they have a really characteristic behavior. You can see it here. That constant little tail wag, the bobbing of the tail. It's almost like a, they can't help but do it. Their butt just keeps bobbing around. So that's a really great behavior clue. If you ever see a bird making a repeated movement like that, it's a great thing to take note of. Don, I have no idea why they do it, but I love that they do. It is so adorable and so helpful because shorebirds are hard. <laughs> So here's a, another example where you can see how that sort of behavior can really help with bird identification. These birds are both kinds of flycatchers. And they're a part of a group that's really hard to identify of flycatchers. They're similar size, they have similar habitats, they have similar color patterns. But one, the Eastern Phoebe is known for bobbing its tail, whereas the other pictured here, the Eastern Wood Peewee is not. So I'll play both videos and look for some subtle behavior ticks that tail bobbing, and then let me know if you think it's the left bird or the right bird. So we'll start this one. All right, there was bird number one. Here's bird number two. Any guesses which is the Eastern Phoebe known for bobbing its tail? Phoebe's on the right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. So it's not a quite as noticeable a movement, maybe as that spotted sandpiper, but it's that kind of just almost compulsive little dip, dip, dip of the tail. And if you're paying close attention to color pattern and what we've talked about, you'll notice that the Eastern Wood Peewee here has some wing bars that the Phoebe lacks, but sometimes that's hard to see in the field. All right, now let's talk about habitat. So habitat does a lot to shape a bird, the way it behaves and the way it looks. Um, so when you think about habitat, that can really help you with identifying birds too. So if you are at a place that has water, you're going to expect to see things like ducks and herons. If you're in the desert, you're going to expect to see a whole totally different set of birds. So habitat can help you know what to anticipate you might see, can help you narrow things down, um, and help you make some final decisions. What that looks like in practice is a little more, oh, sorry, Let me go here first. So another part of um, habitat that is useful to know is range. And range is maybe, it's slightly different than habitat, but it's useful for me to think about it 
in this category of bird ID because we're thinking about where the bird lives. So if you see a bird that has a black cap and a black um, throat, and you're thinking, oh, it's some kind of chickadee and you're you're stuck between a black cap chickadee and a Carolina chickadee, but you're in Louisiana, you have a pretty clear choice here based on the range of where you can expect to see this bird. You can pretty confidently say that it's a Carolina chickadee um, unless you had some really compelling evidence for a stray Bird. But yeah, you can pretty confidently say that you're seeing Carolina chickadees. So range is an important part of that. But if you come to birds that look similar, but have overlapping ranges, overlapping um, size and shape and postures, then habitat can be a really important clue. So here we have a sampling of wrens. What I love about wrens is whatever kind of wren you're looking at, they like to moon you. They like to have their tail straight up in the air. This is a classic wren posture. So if you're looking to sort out a wren based on that kind of behavior cue, all wrens have that, so it's not gonna help you. But if you are in a cactus-laden habitat and you see a wren, you might expect it to be a cactus wren versus and on cattails, you might expect it to be a marsh wren. So habitat can play um, an important role in bird ID in that way. All right, so if we put that together, here we have this image that shows us size and shape of birds. So these birds are to relatively to scale. Um, and we have some habitat information too. So I'd like to just take a second and see if we can identify a couple birds based on habitat and size cues. So here on the ground, we have a bird underneath the wire of the fence. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to what kind of bird that might be? Does it help to say it looks like it's pulling up a worm? <laughs> yeah, so this would be something like a robin. It's kind of a harder one. All right, what about this bird here perched on the trunk of what looks to be a dead tree? some kind of woodpecker, absolutely, yeah. All right, one more. What about our friend down here in the left-hand corner? Some kind of duck, absolutely. And if you want to get really fancy and impress somebody, you see these two little curly cues over the back of the duck? That can be a signal to us that is a male mallard duck or a drake mallard duck. They have those cute little curly cues over their back right there. So yeah, once we start putting in size, shape, and habitat, we can get to group of birds. Sometimes you can get to species of bird, even without that all important color cue. All right, so we've got those four clues to bird ID down. Let's talk about how we start applying those and what tools we have to help us identify birds with confidence. So I have mentioned a couple times the Merlin Bird ID app and I saw some folks, um, oh, I need to edit this slide. This is not available anymore online, it used to be, but it is available as a free app in our the app store. Um, and you should have gotten a recent update if you haven't gotten it yet, yours probably looks like this, but it might look a little different now and I'll show you in a second. 
But the magic of the Merlin app is that it helps you identify birds in four ways by answering some simple questions using a photo ID tool, a sound ID tool, or um, using the explore birds ID tool. And I would like to, assuming my, my computer and phone will cooperate, I would like to demo some of using Merlin with you. Hopefully in a second, you should be able to see Merlin on my computer screen. Are you seeing it there on the right-hand side? Yes. Awesome, fantastic. So Merlin just got an update and I believe over the weekend, it went out to everybody who hadn't gotten it yet. So if your Merlin does not look like this when you open it, um, I recommend going to your app store and checking to see if the update is there. I had to do that. I had to manually update it. Um, and then now it looks like this and it's beautiful. So if you haven't used Merlin before, let me give you a little bit of a tour. There is a new bird of the day, which I'm glad to see people are excited about. So you have a featured bird of the day which is just a great way to get a sense for what's out there. This is a black throat, a green warbler. I love them. Um, their song is pretty fun. To me, from a distance, I have to specify from a distance, it sounds a little bit like the beginning of Beethoven's Fifth. Um, so super fun warbler. And then we have our three main ways of identifying birds. The step-by-step, -step, so these are the five questions that I mentioned, the sound ID and the photo ID. We're gonna start with sound, uh, excuse me, no, we're gonna start with a step-by-step. -step. So if you click on that, it's gonna ask you five simple questions to help you identify a bird. And some of them should be familiar to you, what they're kind of getting at now that we've gone over these four clues to bird ID. The first is, where are you? So this is gonna get at that range question. It's gonna know what birds you're likely to see in your area. So um, we're gonna try to identify this bird on my screen. If you have Merlin I and you haven't used it much before, I encourage you to try and identify it along with us. You should be able to say that this bird is in your area because um, it is broadly across the United States. But I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna say my current location, Ithaca, New York. And I'm gonna say today's date and I'm gonna hit next. Now here comes that size question on the scale of birds that I mentioned. So we've got sparrow, robin, crow, and goose. And it's a little hard to judge size, but this bird is perched on a barbed wire fence, which gives us some idea of size. So I'm gonna say roughly robin sized. And then I'm going to hit next. Our next question is what were the, what were the main colors? You can select up to three. So for this one, I'll say buffer brown and I will say black. And I think that's all I'm gonna say. And we'll hit next. Our next question starts to get at some kind of habitat slash behavior clue, right? So it's where was the bird? Was it eating at a feeder? Was it swimming or wading on the ground, in trees or bushes, on a fence or wire, soaring or flying? I'm gonna say on a fence or wire, cause it's clearly on a barbed wire fence here and hit next. Now it's gonna pop up a list of birds that it's possible that we would have seen today in Ithaca fitting these criteria. So um, what's awesome about this is it's informed by things like eBird data, which is a project where folks go out and report their sightings. So it knows what's being seen around you. And then 
it will provide you with a short list, sometimes 10 birds, sometimes less, of possibles for your area. My recommendation when you are using Merlin is to look for three points, at least three points of agreement on what you're looking at. So looking at the birds that we've got listed, way too much yellow in this one, way too much black in this one. We've got black head and orange breast here, black bird. These aren't looking quite right yet, so I'm not even really gonna stop. All right, now we've got a bird that's starting to look pretty good, right? We've got that overall tan appearance. Some field marks that I notice are these spots on the wings. And I see that on both birds. Um, it has that long pointy tail on both birds. I see pink feet and I see a little bit of a blue eye ring. So that, that looks like a skin eye ring to me. And so we've got four at least already points of agreement between these birds. So we could pretty confidently say that this is our bird. This is a morning dove. Um, and if you wanted to look at other pictures, if I was on my phone, I could swipe. But um, since I'm using this with my mouse right now, I can't really. Oh, wait. Yes, I can. I can drag. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah. So you can look through different pictures here. Here's a juvenile one. It'll tell you right down there. Um, and you can get some different angles and, oh, morning dove on a nest. They build very silly little nests. You can also listen to what the morning dove sounds like. Hopefully you can hear that. So that gives you that um, morning comes from that, oh, it sounds almost like it's crying. Um, you can press this info button. It's gonna give you a description of the bird. You can see some songs here, and then you can see the range of the bird as well. And then if you click, this is my bird, which I will, I'll do because I did see one today already here. Um, there's one that likes to hang out by my house. It will. For my case, it goes ahead and it actually opens up eBird and I could start a checklist and log my bird that way. Some folk, you, that depends, that's a setting though. It might not open eBird for you. That's something you can change in the settings. It might just um, log it in Merlin. Okay, so that is the step-by-step -step ID. I'm going to go ahead and um, come back to the main page here. Photo ID is if if you are lucky enough to have gotten a passable photo of a bird on your phone, it uses computer visioning technique um, techniques to identify it. I'm not sure we can make this work. Oh, it's showing me that's not going to happen. <laughs> okay, there we go. So if we take a photo of this bird I have on my screen. And let's say it wasn't a great photo, but we'll say, okay, anyway. Um, I'm gonna rotate it. And the tricky part is getting the bird in the box. I'm not sure I can quite, yeah. So I can't quite zoom it the way I want to, um, doing it on the computer. We'll see if it can get it. And we'll hit identify. Yep, it got it, morning dove. So even though I didn't have the full, full thing in the box, we've got our morning dove. The other um, function is the sound ID. This is a fantastic function. Um, it, when, I hit, when I hit this button, it will immediately start recording. So I wanna tell you a little bit what to look for first. Um, so it is gonna, well, I'll show you. You can you can watch it do my voice. So it will automatically open up with a spectrogram, which is this up here. And you can see my voice being represented visually. And so every bird song will be represented visually on here too. And then when I start playing a bird song, 
you'll see a little blue dot appear here. That means Berlin is hearing a bird. So if, if you don't see a blue dot while you're playing, it might be that there's too much um, interference like wind or road noise or that there might be um, it might be too far away for Merlin to be hearing. But if you see that blue dot, you know it's hearing something. And then once it hears something, it will appear right here under the spectrogram. And every time it hears that thing again, it will light it up yellow. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit cancel here because I don't wanna actually save this recording of my voice. And then we're gonna see if we can't play a song. All right. So I'm gonna try playing a song and it's my hope that you'll be able to hear it. Okay, so hopefully you saw that blue dot and how it lit up every time it heard the blue jay. Um, there were some other birds chattering in the background that it didn't identify. That's because this recording was actually taken in the winter time and those were evening grosbeaks and you wouldn't expect them to be here now. So it, it would have confused Merlin. So it just picked up on the blue jay, which is great. Um, and then once you do that, you can, um, come to the birds that it heard. And I always recommend you either try and see the bird or you check the call. So we heard that blue jay doing its classic jay call. Now we should listen to the call and see if we agree with what Merlin says. Yeah, that sounds a little more like it. So, I would feel confident saying that's a blue jay now and adding that to a list. Um, and I'm not gonna save this recording because it wasn't um, an actual bird. So you can come here and hit delete. You can also change date and location. I haven't played with that much. I've had some struggles with getting that to work before the update, but um, theoretically I could change the, the time and get a better reading on it. So I'm gonna just hit delete. And that'll take us back to our main screen. And then there's one more function that I wanna show you. And I think this is really an important one for us as educators is this explore function. Right now it functions basically like a field guide. You can see all the birds that I have installed on Merlin right here. I have the full US pack. You might choose to download a pack that's more for your region. So there would be fewer birds. On the right hand side here, you're going to see these silhouettes that we talked about, and that's going to help you jump to a group of birds. So if you wanted raptors, you could jump there. If you wanted herons, you could jump here. Um, but I want to draw your attention to the menu in the upper right hand corner. This is where it gets pretty magical, in my opinion. So I'm going to switch from all installed birds to likely birds for Ithaca, New York for today, and I'm gonna go here by most likely. So this is gonna tell me if I were to go outside right now today and do a bird count, what are the most likely birds I'm gonna see in order of, of likelihood essentially. So here we see some of our common birds that we could expect to see. And the exciting part for us as educators is say I know I'm going to be teaching birds, but I'm not going to do it until January of next year. So I'm going to jump ahead to January, select the date, and I'm going to hit OK. And it's gonna adjust the list of likely birds to that time of year. So now I can plan my unit with what birds I expect my students to see, because that is one of the real tricks of bird ID and something that used to be kind of hard to get unless you just had experience 
is knowing what you're going to see around you. Now Merlin makes that easier. So you can start a list of birds, say 10 or 15, that you expect your students to be able to see and get them to learn those birds. Because in my opinion, and I'd love to know if you share this view, it really helps to focus in on just a few birds at a time. You don't have to know everything all at once. Get to know just a few, get to know them well, and then everything else is easier from there because you can compare what you're seeing to what you know. All right, let's hop back to our slideshow. Thanks for uh, coming on that little adventure with me. All right, so there are a couple ways that you can use that list that I just showed you how to generate. Um, two of them I have featured here as activities that we do that help students really connect into birds and get to know a few birds and I get to know them well. The first one is make your own bird bingo card. We do have a blog with this activity written up in it. Um, you know, pick the top nine birds off of Merlin that you think you'll see around your area. Have your kids draw their own bird bingo card, decide where they want each bird on their card. Um, and then you can play bird bingo and get to know those specific birds. Another great way to use that list is to generate um, a list of birds <clears throat> for each student to get assigned one to become their focus bird. This is that activity we use in our eBird Explorer suite, which I'll mention later. And we use it for all age groups, K, K through 12, um, where you can color a bird if you're in the younger group or draw a bird if you're in the older groups and get to know it really well. So each student becomes an expert in their one bird. Um, so you can have them do research on the bird depending on the age group of the, the kids that you're working with as well. So you can make your own little classroom field guide with these focus birds. All right, let's talk for a second about how to see birds. We've talked a lot about bird identification and the clues to bird ID. Um, actually, there should have been a tool in there that didn't, oh, there it is, somehow I skipped it. Um, I wanna make sure you also know about all about birds. So this is an online field guide from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, really powerful site. Um, it has great descriptions of birds and it has sounds, videos, life history facts, cool facts, nesting facts. So if you do this focus bird activity I mentioned, this is a great source to have their kids, your kids look up their bird and learn more about it. Um, definitely worth checking out. Another one of the great free tools from the lab to help support bird ID. All right, let's talk about seeing birds. So probably when you think about tools to make viewing birds easier, you think binoculars. Um, and binoculars can be kind of an intimidating tool if you haven't used them a lot before. And it can be a hard tool for classrooms to acquire. I absolutely know that. Um, but I wanna make sure that you are prepared um, to be able to make the best choices you can if you're in a position to get binoculars. So the first step is knowing what the numbers mean. So on binoculars, there's usually, um, between the eyepieces, a uh, number like eight by 42, seven by 35. Um, and so those two numbers, it's important to know what they mean. There is a blog on our website about choosing binoculars for kids and it has a video that goes through what those numbers mean. Um, definitely worth checking out. So just a quick rundown, the first number, that eight or seven or 10, that's the magnification. The by number, the 42 or 35 or 50 refers to the aperture. So the size of the lens and the amount of light that gets let in. As a general rule of thumb, you want the second number to be at least four times the first number. So eight by 32, great. 
seven by 35, great. You might sometimes see the little tiny binoculars that are like seven by 25. That is getting to a point where you, depending on the use of them, they might not be worth the investment just because the image can be quite dark. And if it's dark, it's difficult to pick out some of the details. It might be right for your situation, but I just want you to consider that um, four times number. Invest in quality. You'll often see like the kid binoculars, the plastic ones. We've gotten a lot of feedback from educators that they break very, very easily and so aren't necessarily worth the money. My recommendation is always get your hands on the binoculars that you wanna purchase if you can in any way. There are stores like, um, oh my gosh, my I'm totally blanking on the Cabela's, um, Dick's Sporting Goods maybe, Stores like that will sometimes have models that you can um, see in person. And then there are funding sources out there that can help you get binoculars, things like Donor Choose, Donors Choose, I know people have success with. And then we also have a binocular grant that we've been fortunate enough to be able to do for a couple of years and will be coming back this fall. Um, Susan can share a link to that in the chat window. The page is currently um, for last year, but if you bookmark that page when we announce the grants, it will be on the same location. Um, and then one of the big things I recommend is before you take kids outside to use binoculars, practice using them inside. There's a great video. Um, I'll add this link to um, the chat window real quick because I, I don't think we have time to play it actually, but it tells you about ways to use binoculars, how to set them up for your eyes. It's good for using with students too, um, but general rule of thumb, look at something with your naked eyes, then bring your binoculars up and it should be pretty close to in the view instead of just like the thing that kids will do the first time they pick up binoculars, which is just kind of like scan around randomly and make themselves dizzy. Um, so yeah, definitely practice inside before you use it. If you are not able to purchase binoculars, there are other ways that you can bring the birds to you to make, I think it skipped a slide again. Okay, here we go. Um, so to make birds more visible, and I recommend feeding birds. So feeding birds is a fantastic way to bring the birds right to you bring them close enough to view without um, needing binoculars to get that information you need to identify them. And we have some great resources that can help you learn how to start bird feeding. One of them is this um, find the right feeder module. Um, it's an interactive from Project Feeder Watch. And you can choose the region that you're in. You can choose a different type of, different types of seed and then select a type of feeder and see what is likely to be drawn to that feeder. So if you look at, oh, I'm sorry, these pictures are a little blurry, but if you look at um, the here, I have it set to all regions of um, North America, set to Milo and all feeder types versus black oil sunflower. You can see that these two types of seed have a pretty big difference in the type of an amount of birds that they attract. Generally speaking, I recommend black oil sunflower. Um, it tends to attract the largest variety of birds all on its own. Mixes can be great, but um, sometimes just the black oil sunflower is less expensive. Um, and Susan just shared a link to this interactive in the chat window. When you're thinking about setting up a feeder, I did what, just wanna make sure you have this information to hand. Um, the safest zone, so window collisions are a big problem for birds. The safest zone to hang a feeder in is uh, closer than five meters to your home, ideally less than a meter. So quite close to the windows is actually safer. Typically birds, have deadly collisions when they have a lot of speed. So if they are close to the window and they hit it, they're more likely to be okay. 
Um, so the deadliest collision zone is that five to 10 meter zone where a lot of us tend to hang our feeders. So just keep that in mind if you intend to hang a feeder. Again, sometimes feeders aren't an option, but you might be able to plant some plants. So consider planting some native plants. Native plants are really excellent at attracting birds. They provide food and nesting sites, berry plants, um, but also we found that there's lots of research showing that native plants attract a greater variety and number of insects, which is such an important food source for birds. So just having native plants around can help make sure that you've got birds around for your students to view as well. That was a bit of a rush for that end of that. Um, so we're, we're gonna skip these last bits here, but I do wanna jump ahead to um, any questions that you might have and let you know that we would love for you to keep in touch. If you like a letter of completion for one contact hour, you can email us at k12lab at cornell.edu and I can send that to you. Um, and then I forgot to mention at the beginning, but this webinar is being recorded. So I will post this recording on our YouTube channel and everybody who registered will get the link to the recording as well as a link to, um, uh, excuse me, as well as all of the relevant links that we shared today in the chat window. I do have it set so that you can save the chat yourself. I saw somebody ask that question. Um, you should be able to save this chat before we exit. Um, please feel free to ask questions as you're going along. I just wanted to also ask if you would be willing. We have a webinar survey that's live right now. So it's reviewing our webinar series for this year. So if you here at this webinar, we'd love to have your feedback on that. I'll ask Susan to share the link in the chat window. Um, and this will help us shape the future of our webinar series. If you complete it by the end of this week, you'll be in the running for a set of bird ID cards from that. The link to those cards you can check out um, through the survey as well. Also, for the first time, just a heads up, I tried doing a webinar exit survey. So I believe when you leave, that will pop up in a separate window. First time we're trying it. So if you have any feedback on that, love to hear it as well at k12lab at cornell.edu. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. Happy to hang out and answer some questions, but I realize that we're at time um, and I hope to see you at a future webinar. And if I don't, have a wonderful summer.